uh, it's working or not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to share our experience in Mount Sinai uh, Health System. Uh, I'm uh, Arash Kia, uh, data science lead. And I'm Prem Tim Sina, data science engineer lead. Yeah. The next. So. This is our today's agenda. At first, we'll try to explain what kind of problem we are solving, then what is our solutions, then we'll give you the architecture of machine learning platform, and we'll explain our architecture through two use cases, uh, malnutrition predictive engines and 48-hour discharge prediction engine. Then we'll explain our, we'll discuss about our challenges which we face during the development of this platform then finally, talk, we'll talk about our future plan. So this is our team. So currently, we are the Truebill member team. And if you see over here, we are the mix of the data scientists, uh, mathematicians, DevOps engineer, data engineer, hospital operation expert, and the clinicians. So it is the mixed back team. Yeah, so we st let's start from the, uh, the problem, the way that actually uh, uh, we saw the uh, problem and we framed the problem in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the hospital or health system. So we started uh, from uh, actually uh, identifying our opportunities in the, in the hospital. And as you can see, is this is the, uh, actually how we see the decision uh, cycle, decision support cycle in the, in the, in the hospital. Uh, it has three different components, uh, data, uh, knowledge, and learning. So everything starts from documentation. Uh, so uh, the clinicians, they put, they uh, actually do uh, tons of uh, um, evaluation and assessment, uh, and they put it in, um, in an uh, EMR or EHR, uh, electronic uh, records. And uh, so, and then the way that it actually it uh, proceeds is like, uh, so the, data uh, retrieval uh, is happening for each uh, bedside uh, round, and uh, data aggregation um, is happening. Uh, for example, the clinicians, they think that, okay, uh, what was the um, um, actually vital sign uh, for this patient uh, during uh, um, last 12 hours, and what was the B1 uh, creatinine, uh, what was the hem hemoglobin, uh, and then uh, they put everything together, uh, they come up with uh, uh, some differential diagnosis some uh, uh, treatment plan, which is uh, some kind of actually uh, knowledge that they create at the bedside. And then uh, they uh, disseminate that knowledge. Uh, they actually, what they do that sometimes they um, actually put the request for consult. And what happens is uh, they get the feedback, uh, they refine uh, their differential diagnosis. And this cycle actually goes, uh, uh, I mean, each uh, round of the um, actually uh, visiting the patient, and this is the actually picture we grasp from uh, from the process in, inside of hospital. Next one. So, if this is the cycle, then we are dealing with uh, a process, a process which in, uh, actually linked the patient information uh, with uh, uh, actually the clinical uh, knowledge. Uh, without that, okay. Based on this cycle and this process, uh, we have these opportunities. Uh, first of all, we can automate the data retrieval easily. Uh, that's our first opportunity. We can, uh, so, and definitely uh, our, um, actually, uh, span would be um, uh, multiple uh, times more than uh, uh, any human. Uh, because we can uh, actually retrieve the data and aggregate the data uh, from, I don't know, 2011. But uh, if you ask a, a physician about one patient, definitely they cannot actually uh, retrieve the data for that patient from 2011. Uh, we can actually do the real-time computation uh, by using the uh, machine learning uh, approaches. That's another opportunity that we have. And uh, we can actually... Um, uh, communicate with the, we can create a communication channel and communicate everything we, uh, we generate as information or inside at the bedside uh, with the clinicians, get the feedback, create a closed loop, and then uh, we have opportunity of continuous uh, learning. This continuous learning would be the mutual le learning between the engines and also clinicians. They learn from the engines, engines learn from them, and uh, so 
uh, picture is actually our um, optimization uh, strategy around this. But what is the actually uh, the current challenges? So as uh, uh, I guess uh, Daniel ra raised this uh, appropriately uh, from previous um, actually uh, presentation. So data uh, quality is a big challenge. Uh, the data is uh, the uh, data we get is is a product of data collection is in, inside of the uh, actually hospital. So and people uh, are not. Uh, they are not data collectors, yeah? So they are trying to um, save the patient's life. So, uh, but they try to document as well. Uh, so if there is no data governance uh, and there is no framework, then uh, we will have uh, um, significant fluctuation in, in the quality of the uh, data which will be collected. Uh, the other problem we, which we have is interoperability of the clinical data. If you go from one hospital, if you work in one hospital, that's everything is easy because we can, you can come up with some strategy th that solves everything. Uh, but uh, if you uh, work in a health system and that health system is like something like Mount Sinai, uh, mm, it's uh, uh, actually uh, six or seven uh, acute care facilities and um, thousands acute, uh, thousands uh, urgent cares, uh, out, uh, clinics, outpatient clinics, then that's, that's not easy. The uh, interoperability will be a uh, big issue because you uh, build something for one hospital, you want to deploy for the other hospital, uh, and you see that, okay, these hospitals, uh, they um, exchange the patients, but uh, they're using different uh, app platforms. Uh, uh, some of them Epic, some of them all scripts, some of them Cerner for ADT, some of them actually uh, different, um, Eagle for A ADT. Uh, so, uh, that's also would be a, a big problem. Data sharing is, uh, everybody knows about that, that uh, uh, hospitals and health systems are very con conservative about that. And uh, uh, the um, standardization and the, the data representation and terminology uh, is really tough because uh, um, everybody thinks that uh, these platforms, they, are, they, they should use the national libraries for, uh, I don't know, for, uh, uh, for medications like RX norm uh, or um, national um, libraries for um, for uh, lab uh, uh, codes like LOINC, but uh, when you actually go and work with them, you, you see that uh, none of them are, are actually using any kind of uh, centralized uh, libraries. In terms of the uh, actually uh, uh, knowledge uh, challenges, uh, so the main uh, problem uh, which we actually uh, we noticed was uh, the guideline. So uh, we have a very long list, the backlog of uh, uh, machine learning, uh, actually uh, request, uh, modeling request, but, uh, but th that mentality that, okay, I have the best model, uh, so what would be the, uh, actually, the guideline? Uh, or best practices uh, for using this information. Because the paradigm is, is different, yeah? So currently in the medicine, uh, everything is based on the, uh, some kind of very close to rule engine. Uh, we uh, see some of the uh, indications and contraindications, uh, inclusion or exclusion criteria. We see that, okay, this is Sears, or this is uh, severe sepsis, this is septic shock. But uh, what happens if you predict uh, that patient is going to develop the uh, severe sepsis or septic shock within the next 12 hours, uh, what is the guideline for that? And uh, be, so in these kind of cases, uh, so nobody knows the answers. Uh, the other thing is uh, actually uh, uh, integration into the, um, uh, into the uh, point of care is a, is a big challenge. Uh, identifying the, because all the time is changing, it's specifically in the um, academic, uh, academic hospitals, there are tons of uh, residents, uh, actually uh, f uh, fellows, uh, they are changing all the time, they have in, in rotation, identifying the uh, care team and uh, do the integration with the right appropriate uh, care team is, is, a, uh, is a big challenge. 
So in terms of uh, architecture, actually, uh, as I mentioned so before, is integration is, is a big challenge. Uh, integration to the, uh, into the EHR uh, it means that let's say that you don't do uh, actually your computation and uh, your notification system inside of the uh, EMR. Uh, in, our, in the previous uh, presentation, Daniel showed us uh, how we can use the uh, EPIC as one of the biggest, uh, actually, uh, EMR in the uh, US. Uh, if you use the computational platform of EPIC, how we can uh, uh, do the, uh, send the notification and integrate to the point of care somehow. Uh, and he uh, raised this point that uh, if we want to do the, uh, actually, uh, the mapping, the, um, the, uh, apply the transformation map, the uh, normalization map, it takes months, actually, uh, to deploy the model. Uh, if you want to change the game uh, and deploy within one week, uh, then uh, integration to the EPIC should be done, and that's a, that's a big challenge. And we try to solve that. Uh, and also, uh, the other thing is uh, the timing. So most of the uh, uh, modeling um, is happening uh, in the, uh, um, uh, in, by using the data warehouses or, um, or uh, in the, by using the um, reporting databases, uh, which has uh, around 24 hours uh, lag. Uh, so, but if you want to actually, um, for example, uh, create a notification system or early warning system for something which is um, acute in, in, term, in, in terms of uh, condition like delirium, uh, which is happening um, uh, actually in a, a very acute uh, duration and very short duration and is repetitive, uh, so, or sepsis, uh, so you need to actually have uh, um, a real-time uh, pipeline to ingest the data and uh, create a, a prediction and deliver that uh, prediction uh, very fast uh, to the appropriate, uh, actually, uh, target audience. Uh, so here is actually the, um, uh, the, our plan uh, which we did uh, for, so, so I actually tried to uh, explain the, our, the current scenario. Uh, so uh, the, the actually uh, ad hoc type of uh, modeling is happening inside of the um, health system. Uh, actually, before our team, now uh, we uh, change the game. Uh, we don't deal uh, with the ad hoc anymore. Uh, and also uh, utilize the pre-built uh, data-driven uh, actually tools. Uh, so it, when everything is ad hoc, uh, so one problem is uh, you are actually uh, facing with a different or thousand type of transformation normalization uh, of the data. Uh, and also it, it changes the uh, reproducibility of uh, each, each model uh, output. But on the other hand, uh, it creates another uh, problem. The, another problem would be, uh, so um, the uh, development cycle would be very long uh, because uh, you, you don't uh, develop any toolkit that everybody actually can uh, use. And uh, that's not a very collaborative environment that actually uh, can um, facilitate the development and uh, deployment cycle. Talk. Let's talk about our proposed solutions. So to overcome all, all those challenges which Aras mentioned, so we develop a machine learning platform. So before developing the platform, these are our minimum requirement. So the first requirement is it should be automated. So we'll deploy the dozens of use cases in, in our machine learning platform. So it should be automated as much as possible. The next one is it should be easy to develop and deploy clinical data science app. So once, when we are develop, deploying multiple use cases, so we want to develop a platforms where it is easy to develop a new use case and deploy the use case. Again, the third one is modular. So we want to develop a platform which is in the modular fashion. So they are, once we develop for one use case, it can be used across the multiple use cases. 
And the fourth one is, of course, it is scalable. So for the health system like Mount Sinai, we first develop uh, in the one hospital, deploy it in one unit, and if it is successful, we want to scale it across the nine hospital uh, in the New York City. And another is, so in the healthcare, there are multiple type of the data. It is uh, 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 structured data, unstructured data, clinical data, and it is the imaging data and genomics data. So the platform should be able to ingest all types of, the, of, of those data, able to transform it and use it. And finally, the platform should be the HIPAA compliant or the secure. So this is our architecture. So if you see that, uh, so this is the data production environment. So we have the multiple data production environment. So we have the news. For the ADT, we have the different platform. For the lab, we have the different platform. So all these data production environment does not communicate with each other directly. They communicate with each other through the centralized interface, which is Cloverleaf. We call it AIG. So all those data communicate through the AIG or the centralized interface. And from the centralized interface, we get the stream of HL7 messages. So we have the one stream of, for the ADT, another for the flow seed, another for the lab. And all those messages come to the Morse Connect. So Morse Connect is nothing but the uh, uh, data, uh, data interface system for the healthcare. So it can take data in any format, like a HL7, JSON, text, or any format, and can, board, can convert that data into the JSONs or anything. So all those data come to the Morse Connect, and then we write those data into the MongoDB. And from the MongoDB, we have the multiple machine learning use cases running. And the output of the machine learning use case is the uh, predictions. So if you see that we only not uh, we also generate the prediction and we also generate the top 10 features for that predictions and uh, the output is in the form of a hl7 message then we send the hl7 message again to morse connect and this morse connect send the message to the hospital centralized interface and this hospital centralized interface distribute the predictions back to the epic or any other users. So for example, in our early warning system, we send the predictions to the Boishara or the nurses. And if the prediction score is very high, we also send the predictions to the curator, which is the iPhone applications. And we also write the predictions in the, into the Epic. Uh, and we also have the custom UI. So this is how a clinician can see the prediction score in the EPIC. So it is the, in the color-coded form. So for example, we have the score and we have the band, so we, which is high, so based on this band. Uh, so in the patient list, the prediction is color-coded. So for the, um, for the technology, so what kind of technology we use? So to create a data lake, we use the MongoDB and the MySQL. And as a messaging system, we use the Apache Kafka. And as a ETL engines, or the uh, machine learning uh, uh, software environment, we use the Apache Spark again. And for the modeling, we use the Keras uh, TensorFlow and the Spark MLE. And finally, for the visualizations, we have developed multiple custom UI based on the Plotly and the Jupyter. And this infrastructure currently hosted is uh, in the on-promise environment. And currently, we are in the phase of creating a hybrid cloud with the Microsoft Azure. So let's talk about how we store the data or how the data is flowing in our system. So for example, you can see that there is, this is the stream of message. This is the ADT, flow seed, lab. So all these stream of messages we write it as it is in the MongoDB. So from the MongoDB, so we have the change stream features, which is enable. So if there is any update in this database, it creates the stream of data from the MongoDB. And we have the custom client, which is written in Go programming language. So this custom client um, write this data into the Kafka producer. So we have the different Kafka topic corresponding to each, uh, uh, each channels. And 
from the Kafka, we have the Apache Spark streaming engines running. So the streaming engines picks the uh, messages from the Kafka topics and process the message. Okay, one of the actually uh, our the uniqueness of our platform is uh, that single view structure that we uh, we try to use in our actually platform. Uh, if you notice, uh, we, our all of our communication with other platforms is happening through can can happen, but uh, actually through the HL7, either using the HL7 or JSON. Uh, so because the main language in, uh, in healthcare is HL7, so currently we are receiving everything based on the uh, HL7 messages, the stream. Uh, but inside of our prat, uh, platform, uh, um, actually everything is, uh, is uh, the language, uh, the structure is JSON. And because of that, we started actually uh, using, instead of uh, using the relational uh, database, we started using uh, NoSQL, non MongoDB, which is very uh, uh, compatible with the JSON structure. Because we have that uh, opportunity to uh, actually uh, use this data structure of JSON, uh, which is hierarchical, uh, we uh, actually created a single view for the patient. It means that uh, for each uh, visit, uh, we can actually uh, get the data uh, for each patient, actually, we can get the data from different size, sites. We have uh, seven hospitals. Uh, we can get from different uh, platforms, uh, lab platform, EKG platform, EPIC, uh, ADT, or different platforms. Uh, in terms of the data type, uh, we have um, actually, we can uh, uh, get the note, uh, which is uh, free text. Uh, we, uh, we are getting the uh, different customized uh, flow sheets from Epic, uh, which, it, which is uh, semi-structured. And we have uh, tons of actually structured data we get from, uh, from the Epic, um, the EMR. And what we do is, uh, our business, main business, actually is uh, time series prediction. We don't uh, actually get the last value and create a, um, a prediction based on the last value. We do the, uh, we create a time series by applying different, uh, actually, variable type of uh, sampling, uh, variable in terms of frequency, uh, and uh, duration, sampling duration. Uh, and we identified uh, that in advance uh, by uh, actually uh, seeing the, um, the actual data availability for each uh, variables or features that we have, we use. And then uh, we create our um, actually time series for different um, um, variable input and then put or features and then uh, put together uh, and create a big uh, giant time series then with all of our training, testing, validation, everything is happening based on that. Uh, but how we uh, actually create this patient single view? So, uh, so it's actually it starts from the, um, uh, we can skip this actually, uh, yeah. Uh, so let's say that we actually get the, so in MongoDB we have one collection. For each collection, uh, actually, in each collection, we say that, okay, we, can, we wanna create a single view based on the, our uh, visit. Uh, um, and in this visit, uh, we can actually create a hierarchical uh, structure, uh, adding different things. I think actually one hierarchical is related to a lab. So all of the lab, let's say in lab we have a, a sodium measurements. So we add all all the uh, actually uh, we um, update each uh, document and insert into that document all the um, value we get uh, related to that. Uh, sodium measurement. So in that case, if you, for example, in, in our database, is if you uh, uh, look for one MRN, uh, you can see uh, in one document, you can see um, actually all the visits, uh, and in each visit, you can actually see all the labs, uh, all the notes, uh, and everything related to that, and uh, you can see all the uh, values related to different kind of uh, lab items. And everything is like hierarchical uh, structure. 
And this single view we create uh, at the level of vitals, at the level of lab, at the level of EKG, and then put them um, actually together and uh, create our giant uh, single view, which we use for our uh, actually create a feature vector at the time of prediction. Uh, and it uh, actually uh, it gi it gives us the benefit of optimized performance for each uh, computation. Let's talk about the data processing flow. So for example, we get the data, how the data is processed across our uh, machine learning architecture or machine learning platforms. So we have the two kind of the uh, data load. So one is the batch load. So when you get a batch of the data, so when you load the data from the data warehouse, so we write the data uh, like in the raw from format in the, our raw database. So then we have the batch uh, ETL pipeline, which is actually the Apache Spark pipeline. It clean the data, transform the data, normalize the data, and we write again into the uh, clean database. And from the clean database, we have the multiple batch machine learning uh, engines running. So this is the batch pipeline. And again, we have the stream data, stream data pipeline. In the stream data pipeline, what we have is we have the multiple stream of the data that is coming in our system. So ADT, lab, EKG, vitals, all those things. And through the change stream in the MongoDB, we have the, again, when you write the raw data into the MongoDB, MongoDB create a stream of the data, then it goes to the Apache Kafka, and from the Apache Kafka, Spark streaming engines pull those data, do all the cleaning, transformation, normalizations, and again write the data into the uh, uh, clean database. And from the clean database, again we have the change stream and Apache Kafka, then we have the streaming machine learning engine running over the uh, this stream uh, pipeline. And since it is the 24-7 um, uh, running machine learning platform, so we should have the uh, multiple monitoring system uh, in place. So what we are doing is, so this is just one example. So what we are doing is we are continuously monitoring, for example, how much data we are getting in our ADT channel, EKG channel, lab channel, flow sheet channel. And if you see over here, it is showing, for example, in um, every 15 minute, how much predictions we are making for one use cases. So this dashboard is made out of the Plotly, but we use the Splunk, Nagios, and other multiple tools to continuously mon monitor our system. Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> we picked actually two use cases. Uh, one, uh, malnutrition, actually risk prediction, which is uh, we deployed for uh, four hospitals. Um, we actually developed the, uh, the, uh, the engine in um, the model in, in one um, hospital, the main campus, Mount Sinai Hospital, and then we uh, deployed for uh, four hospitals, uh, which um, so I, I can show you that uh, uh, the, the performance of this uh, actually model. And uh, so this um, use case uh, has been uh, started in 2017. Uh, in 2018, March 2018, we started actually talking about this. Uh, by um, within six months, actually, we uh, deployed the model uh, in the uh, main hospital. Uh, and uh, after um, three months, actually, we deployed in two ho more hospitals and then uh, one more, um, more hospital, and, and then it, it reached to the four hospital. Uh, currently, this is a mature product. Uh, hopefully, we can commercialize it and uh, actually give the service for other uh, hospitals uh, if they are interested. Um, so the, the whole idea is uh, actually, um, it's a, malnutrition is a, severe malnutrition is a, is a chronic condition. Uh, it's a protein energy um, uh, actually uh, imbalance. Uh, it's a valuable. Uh, because of uh, two uh, actually main points. One, uh, because uh, malnutrition actually has impact on the immune uh, actually system, and in, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very important factor in, 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 a, in a process of uh, care. Uh, that's one, one piece. Uh, so uh, identifying uh, malnutrition 
uh, can uh, customize the treatment plan, and based on that, the quality of care can be improved. That's one uh, big, uh, actually, point. The other point is uh, the financial. Uh, so if you um, identify the, uh, the malnutrition, uh, then it can be documented. Uh, so then uh, it's, uh, you can actually uh, you can claim that, and many of your uh, lab claim or uh, different claims for, for the payers, you, it can be actually accepted. And uh, the other thing is it has a huge impact uh, on the, on the uh, expected uh, risk of mortality. Uh, so the uh, O2I will increase, and then it has also uh, financial uh, impact. Uh, because of that, actually, we started this project. Uh, when we started that project, uh, as uh, can we actually go back to one? Yeah. Uh, we were um, in January of 2018, a, um, actually, a big army of uh, registered dietitian, uh, dietitians, they were actually uh, recruited in Sinai. Uh, we were around uh, three point something uh, less than average uh, of the reporting for malnutrition, and uh, we became uh, 7.6. Uh, then uh, we started and uh, we asked that what, what kind of uh, screening tool they are they're using. So uh, they were using the MUST malnutrition universal screening tool, uh, which uh, it had. Uh, really, uh, we, we actually uh, collected the data and we showed that, okay, the sensitivity is 23%, and, uh, but it's very specific, a specific test, yeah? The specificity is 97, so it means that uh, this tool uh, has really great, uh, actually, uh, power in identifying the negative cases. Uh, but uh, the problem is uh, they, were they were using this, uh, actually, tool to identify the positive cases. Uh, then... Uh, the next slide. Uh, so then uh, we, th we thought that, okay, uh, it's uh, enough, uh, actually, um, not enough. It's around uh, 1,000 uh, actually um, labeled uh, patient we have. It means that uh, 1,000 patient actually around uh, 1,200 uh, that they, um, they had their registered, certified registered dietitian um, uh, actually, um, evaluation, uh, and we knew that uh, we knew the label for them. Uh, we said, uh, okay, uh, let's start with them, uh, all of them in uh, in uh, inpatient adult, uh, and we said, okay, what we can do is we can create a prioritization actually tool. Uh, we train a model. We know that at the beginning uh, the overfitting rate would be high, uh, but it's okay. Uh, if we build something which uh, it shows actually uh, decent uh, sensitivity and specificity, then we can actually uh, work like this. So we generate, uh, every day we generate the prediction, prediction goes to the EPIC, uh, they can create a patient list, uh, they can sort based on the score, and they can start uh, actually visit the patient, and uh, they can uh, document in the uh, flow sheet that, uh, that was created for this purpose. And in that case, we have opportunity of the closed loop uh, between our engine and clinicians. And what happens is um, we can actually do the continuous updating the model, and uh, that solves many problems. Uh, Yeah, so we started with uh, uh, one, uh, 1155 uh, actually features, uh, more than 1,000 features. But after the, uh, doing the um, recursive feature uh, elimination uh, approach, we uh, came up with uh, 400, uh, 300 something. Uh, so the, if you compare it with the MUST, or uh, any other actually malnutrition tool. So they only actually use a BMI uh, plus one or two more uh, variables. So they predict, uh, predict based on uh, three variables, and we predict based on uh, almost uh, 400 variables, uh, features actually. Um, next one. So, um, and our features is combination of the nursing evaluation, uh, lab, uh, so mainly on lab, uh, and here is the list of the 10 uh, most important variables. 
uh, so mm, it's, it's obvious the weight is very important. Albumin, age, uh, length of stay, uh, BUN, hemoglobin, uh, height, and uh, potassium, creatinine, and uh, ALT. Uh, so this is the, I don't go through the detail of the model parameter, and, but we started actually using this in our uh, daily batch, and uh, we actually got the score uh, very, uh, our score at the beginning was at the scale of 0 0.73, uh, but we went through a multiple round of um, model updating, and currently our score is 0 0.82. Next one. Uh, here is actually it shows that uh, how much was our historical performance and how much was our uh, streaming performance uh, at, the, at the beginning, which currently has been changed. And, uh, and here shows the actually uh, the, our um, actually the model uh, with the cutoff of uh, 0 0.5. Uh, what is the sensitivity? The sensitivity is around uh, I guess uh, 84 in the streaming, and um, and the sensitivity is uh, 53. We could actually boost the sensitivity uh, while the uh, specificity hasn't been dropped uh, significantly. Uh, and here is actually uh, till May. Uh, from September 2018 uh, till May 2019, we could actually change uh, the documentation uh, rate for, uh, for uh, malnutrition. And uh, I guess now we are even uh, more than uh, 10. We are very close to 12. Uh, but we started uh, from uh, um, 8, 7.6. Uh, thank you, Aras. So our next use case is 48-hour discharge prediction engine. So what we are predicting is, uh, so for all the inpatients, so which patients will be discharged into the next 48 to 62 hours? So the reason is that, so we'll give about two days for the, um, for the nurses and the doctors to prepare those patients for the discharge. Uh, so, so, so you can see that, so the background is, uh, so when we predict in advance of the two days who the patients who are going to discharge, we give enough time for the, uh, for the nurses and the clinicians to prepare those patients to get discharged. So, so our population characteristics is the patient class is in patient and the age is greater than 18 years old and we only include those patients who are staying more than two days or 40 to 48 hours. So, so this is quite different than malnutrition or other engines because each patient's patient will ultimately get discharged. So while creating a model from the same visit, we need to create both positive uh, sample and the negative sample. So what we consider positive sample is, uh, so, if, uh, if the patient get discharged within the 48 and 62 hours, then we, we say that, okay, this is the positive samples. And at the time of the sample creations, if the patient is not getting discharged between the 48 and 62 hours, then we consider this as a negative samples. And again, you can see that when we make a predictions, we go back 36 hours and take all the variables or all these uh, electronic health record of the patients, which was measured in the last 36 hours. And we create the time series information. So for example, we sample blood pressure, lab value, and all those things every six hours. So you can see that, uh, so our AC score, uh, is, AC score is about 70%, and these are the top 10 variables for the 48-hour discharge, and our sensitivity was around 61%, and specificity is around 67%. Uh, this is the historical uh, performance. Currently, the model, uh, model is in the active pilot phase, uh, so we are deploying this model in the three unit, probably in the next two or three weeks, 
will deploy this model across the whole, across the main hospitals in the uh, mm -hmm. in the yeah. Manhattan. Let me add one more thing uh, here. This is the baseline actually uh, 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 model based on the historical, because uh, after we deployed the model and we went to the streaming part, and then uh, we uh, started actually to retrain the model because we had the opportunity to uh, to because of that close uh, loop, the case managers could actually evaluate our uh, prediction. We could um, uh, actually through that closed loop, we, we could uh, we, we had the opportunity to retrain the models and update the model. And then we went uh, currently in our streaming, our AUC is around 0.81, I guess. And uh, so we um, both our sensitivity and specificity went uh, above the 70. So actually, yeah. we have the AC curve for the silent pilot. It is around 81%. So this is the proposed workflow. So currently, uh, uh, so we have the red cap, uh, create a red cap created for the uh, nurses or the clinical managers. So for example, we send the predictions uh, into the uh, uh, EPIC and they look the patient uh, who, uh, who have the positive predictions for the 48 hour discharge. And they, for example, label, is the patient's clinical ready, ready for discharge or not? So if they say no, either they say no or either say they, so yeah, they say yes. And either they say no or yes, they will, re, uh, they will document that into the red cap. And from the red cap, we pull this data in our, our data science engine. So currently, we also we are developing our epic flow sheet. So probably next week or in the next couple of weeks, so we'll phase out the red cap and clinician document everything into the epic flow sheet. So this is how currently uh, clinician are seeing the prediction score in the epic. So for example, for the patient who are ready to get discharge in the next 48 hours to 62 hours, of course it is LO, so it's good they can go home. And for the patients who are not uh, clinically ready to get discharged within the 48 to 62 hours, it is red. Challenges. <clears throat> Actually, uh, one of the main challenges is uh, data governance. Uh, the data governance actually is uh, is a risk and uh, basically is killing all of our prediction. It's changing our performance because uh, they because we don't have data governance uh, initiative. Uh, any of this platform, they can they they think that they can actually do whatever changes that they like, and uh, because their default is nobody is using this data. Yeah, this is just data for storing and for reporting and. Uh, but uh, we get uh, actually weight zero. Uh, it has it will have impact in our BMI. Uh, we are using the BMI uh, in uh, our uh, prediction for malnutrition, and uh, we get actually uh, completely um, distorted in our uh, prediction. So that one thing is uh, in data governance. The other thing is uh, we uh, provide the information. Uh, which is prognostic uh, and is different from predictive, yeah? So predictive is uh, actually you, uh, for example, like uh, rule engine, you say that, okay, and if the pulse rate is above this, is uh, the patient has a leukocytosis. If the patient, the respirator is above this, the patient currently has Sears, yeah? Uh, but uh, there is no time, there is no golden time. So the Sears happened and nobody can actually change uh, anything for that patient. But what we are doing is we are saying that, okay, this patient will reach to that point within six hours. Now they go and see the patient, so the, this patient is really actually is, is healthy. Yes. Uh, and they actually give us some uh, feedback that, okay, patient is watching uh, actually Argentina's uh, uh, match with, uh, and after uh, actually six hours, oh, they say, oh, this patient needs to transfer to the ICU, yeah. Uh, so what is the, the problem? The problem is uh, actually there is no guideline best practice for this piece, and is, I guess this is very uh, actually important challenge. The other thing is uh, reinforcing clinical documentation is very important. Uh, currently, there is no also governance on, on the way that uh, all of these uh, epic flow sheets uh, is creating or uh, created. Uh, I don't know who is responsible in our health system, so it seems that each team is doing that, and 
and there is no standard actually over uh, that kind of uh, creation and uh, and the drop down that they create. Uh, sometimes it's totally nonsense, and we don't get anything from those kind of stuff. The technical challenges. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, still uh, we try to actually well, some of our. Um, uh, work is around creating uh, data dictionaries uh, to, f to identify what kind of information we have in our uh, EMR in different hospitals, how we can actually map them, because without data dictionary, we cannot do anything. The other thing is uh, creating uh, the universal or uh, um, uh, k kind of uh, terminology or for, uh, for uh, some of the semi-structured uh, data. Uh, the other technical challenge is data quality, as I uh, mentioned a lot, and uh, one big difference. If you go to the finance uh, world uh, or e-commerce e world, you can see tons of blueprints in terms of uh, engineering blueprints. What kind of uh, components you should use? How you should you can actually um, stick, uh, stitch this this kind of components? Uh, what is the blueprint for that? But if you come to the healthcare, there's nothing, and uh, we need to actually uh, make everything from scratch. So let's talk about our future plan. So. Or one of the, um, so what we t are planning to do is, so currently everything is on promise. So we are in, pro we are in process of moving our infrastructure, our machine learning platforms in the hybrid cloud infrastructures uh, along with the, uh, Microsoft Azure. So we have our server in the data centers and we, we also have the Microsoft Azure. So we want to create our platform uh, based on the hybrid cloud. So next is, Currently, we are making a predictions based on the structured data and the textual data. So in the future, for our future machine learning model, we are planning to, planning to use the imaging data and also the genomics data. The third one is, so currently, uh, so we want to create a software as a service for each of our use case and, prob and probably for each hospitals deploy the new use case as a software, as a service, and also if there is any, any other health system they want to co collaborate with us, then we can easily collaborate since we create our use case based on as a software, as a service. Then finally, and the last one is uh, we want to provide uh, our uh, use cases uh, to other health system nationally and internationally. And thank you very much. If you have any questions, you are welcome. All right, thank you to uh, Prem and Arish. We're going to go around for questions. A uh, show of hands, we'll start right here. Hi. So because your data is connected directly to the EMR, right, uh, how are you guys handling anonymization? So everything, so no data is anonymized. So everything is PSI. OK. Operationalize uh, actually clinical operational uh, a clinical data science team. So we we our goal is not uh, publishing paper. We publish paper, but uh, that's not our f first goal. So uh, whatever we have is operational database, and we are working with the PHI data. Congratulations. I think you're forging a very good path for this. So I just want a clarification. You said that you do publish papers, mm -hmm. but the first requirement of any respectable journal is an institutional review board. So yeah. how do you, do you do that before? But if you do that afterwards, then you never really got permission from the IRB to do the science. So we work in very close collaboration with our, our IRB department. And of course, we have the IRB for all of this project in advance. OK. Yeah, so uh, most of our work is uh, based on the quality improvement. So we start our work based on the quality improvement. Then when we want to actually, actually publish that, uh, we apply for the uh, IRB, uh, for the historical part, and also for the uh, prospective uh, pilot. And some of our actually uh, a project li like uh, Muse Plus, um, Medical Early Warning System Plus, 
uh, which is uh, to, to identify the uh, clinical de deterioration, uh, we uh, actually submitted as a clinical trial uh, because those kind of applications should be si uh, actually signed as a uh, clinical trial and then uh, all the clinical trial rules and regulation applies to them. Can I ask you one other question? How, how do you validate your model? Or yes. is that built into the, the training? Yeah, so it's uh, two uh, phases. The first phase is uh, silent pilot. We deploy them, is a silent pilot. We deploy the model without sending to our, uh, actually, um, uh, to our agent of action. For example, uh, if the um, audience of the model is rapid response team, we uh, don't send it. We just uh, um, run it in background and we do the evaluation. Uh, the next phase is uh, actually active pilot. Uh, what we do is now we actually turning, we start writing in the Epic uh, or sending to the, um, our um, smartphone app. Uh, then what happens is uh, we actually uh, calculate, it's, it's like a clinical trial, yeah? So we have a randomization, we have the, um, uh, actually, uh, the uh, process, uh, we, t we, we should identify that uh, in the current workflow, which is the sweet spot that we can incorporate, uh, and uh, we, n we calculate the sample size. For example, for one of the use uh, our use cases, it takes, uh, if I'm not wrong, is around 19 months uh, to do the active pilot. In some cases, like malnutrition, uh, as soon as we get the green light from the users that this is not uh, creating too much work for us and it makes our work very easy, we actually uh, deploy uh, for all hospitals. And, That's the and I guess another point, so the 48-hour discharge, the second use case which we mentioned, so it is still in the active pilot phase from the last month. So until we validate everything. So currently we started with the red cap, then the clinician said that they doesn't want to do in the red cap, they want to integrate in the EPIC. Now we are developing an EPIC flow seed. So uh, based on the use case, probably it takes a month to two or three months to mature the product from active pilot to the uh, full scale production or the deployment. And for all the use cases, so we develop a model, we put into the silent pilot, so then we evaluate the model ourselves, then we put the active pilot, at that point we, uh, we, uh, we have the clinicians and all the, uh, all the stakeholders to evaluate the model, and finally then only we move the product to the full productions. Um, well, thanks for a great presentation. Special thanks for uh, covering all the topics that I neglected or forgot to cover. So I, I think you did it very well. Um, a question, you mentioned that you um, iterate. In other words, you once you have developed the model, you get the feedback from the providers, and then you feed it back into the model, and then you iteratively improve it. Could you elaborate on how exactly it's done? Because it's a very, very important part of model development and improvement. So, so initially, we have the continuous model updating pipeline. So what it used to do is, so for its predictions, we also used to store the future vectors. Then automatically, every week or so, it, we used to uh, retrain the model, and, re, and if the new model is better than the old model, we used to replace the old, mo old model with the new model. So what was the problem was, uh, so the cutoff would change um, continuously, and the model parameter would also change. So the clinician were not happy. So currently what we are doing is, so when we retrain the model, so probably based on the use case, so we retrain every two months or every three months, and before deploying the new updated model, we pass, we, we have the working group, and we pass all those informations to the clinicians, and we say that, hey, from these days, from this specific date, we have the new updated model. Yeah, uh, so that was uh, one main approach, using our uh, stored data uh, coming from streaming. Uh, the other approach actually we used and it worked very well was uh, we have uh, all the codes and everything related to streaming. Uh, so we try to um, identify 
uh, so actually uh, define uh, some of the uh, reference time. Uh, if we want to do the batch, uh, everyday batch, so reference time would be um, actually every day. If it's uh, real time, we can actually uh, choose the, it's, it's really, it's more complicated. You need to uh, actually create a list of uh, um, reference time. And then you can use your historical um, uh, create a simulation of what uh, you actually uh, implemented as a prediction uh, and create exact same uh, feature vector that you are creating in the streaming. Uh, in that case, uh, you don't need to save all of those uh, actually uh, real-time prediction or uh, daily prediction. Uh, you just want to, you, you just need to actually run that, uh, the whole, uh, uh, framework on the uh, on your historical data. Okay. Uh, question in back here. Thank you. Uh, very very nice talk. Um, couple uh, one question uh, that I had about a bullet point. You said that your data is sparse but requires a lot of cleansing, which is an interesting um, thing. Um, a couple questions. One is how big are these data sets for a, a typical analysis? And then also, what are your cleansing operations like? Is it like standard ETL? SQL filtering kind of stuff, or and then vector set preparation. Um, can you describe that a little bit, please? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's sparse because uh, we are dealing with different uh, patient, different patient type. All of them, they're not uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, in terms of one va specific variable. They don't get the same uh, frequency of measurement uh, for for that specific variable. In that sense, the data is uh, very sparse. In some of the uh, um, actually uh, time series, uh, you may have only one va um, one value. Uh, some of them based, uh, you, you may have uh, actually full uh, array of the values. Uh, that's about the uh, um, actually. Uh, sp uh, sparse. Uh, the other thing, uh, the, your question, uh, your uh, question uh, the, was the about data size, and then you kind of eat the ETL. Or yeah, the ETL that we are doing is uh, actually um, on the streaming side. Uh, we are using our um, normalization and transformation map, which we created based on the historical data. Basically, on in our streaming part, we are not. Uh, mm, Sorry, based on uh, actually uh, in our streaming, the pipeline, we don't do any kind of traditional uh, ETL. Okay. Uh, but in our historical part, uh, which we are uh, trying to get familiar with the data, and uh, we don't know anything uh, about the data, we start uh, doing those kind of actually uh, traditional or classical ETL. But we do everything in, uh, in Spark, uh, and yeah. Okay. And Thank you. And another point is for the streaming data, currently we get about 1 million update per day. And for some channel like a progress node, it is about uh, 1 gigs or 2 gigs of data per day. So, but other years are non clinical nodes data are way smaller. And for the batch data, for example, one of the data warehouse is Clarity. So Clarity, sometimes when we do the pool, it's very huge data. And we also have the Mount Sinai data warehouse. It is quite smaller. So, But uh, for the data warehouse, we are selective on what kind of data we want to pull. Great. Other questions? Here you go. Related. Are, are you using Caboodle? Uh, we started to use the Caboodle initially, but we did not, uh, the data w w was not published in our Mount Sinai Caboodle. So we stopped using the Caboodle. Currently, we are using the Clarity as a data warehouse, and we also have the Mount Sinai Research Data Warehouse. But currently, most of the data we are getting in the streaming fashions. Hi, I was wondering how long did it take to develop or to build the entire technical infrastructure that you showed in that one diagram, like just from start to, to have that all built? So we started, Aras and me started in the Mount Sinai probably from the, in the March of 2017. So I was 25%, he was 50% uh, in the department. So. Initially, we developed a POC project, so they have given us a big server. So we develop everything in just one server. We have the POC machine learning platform. Then we demo our platform to our uh, leadership. 
and they were excited. Okay, they, they thought that POC was successful. Then uh, probably in 2018 or somehow. It took to nine months actually to have uh, something uh, deployable for in, in our first uh, set of the servers. Yep. And probably in the 2018, they, they gave us the budget to hire the whole team. Currently we have the 2L team and now this is, everything is operational system. Any other questions? One over here. Hi, a nice talk. Actually, I saw uh, you are discussing about uh, a single patient view. So, as there are seven hospitals and tens of uh, data uh, sources, so how you deal with like uh, somebody's data is not uh, so not uh, reported or missing from some hospital. Yeah, uh, and I second guess, yeah. and one more question. Sorry. Yeah. Second question is: Do you guys have data related to the cardiac surgery and all? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, related to cardiac surgery, we have uh, actually cardiology and cardiac surgery in Sinai. I guess uh, the, the, their rank is uh, around uh, top six, uh, in the, in the, based on the U.S. Uh, news. Um, uh, related to your null uh, missing values, uh, in the model we actually uh, we uh, apply dif different rules. For example, one of the rules that we use is uh, we uh, get the uh, actually median of our uh, population for that uh, uh, for that value and use that. Uh, but the main challenge is uh, we need to create a, a one map uh, to get the data from different platforms and then and create our single uh, view for each patient. Thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing some of the details around the technology stack. That mm -hmm. was really helpful. Um, can you guys share some, like, maybe two or three key lessons learned, maybe related to tools or processes? So the main lesson was the, the platform which we saw us. Uh, we went through probably six or seven iterations to create this platform. So currently, as Aras mentioned, initially when you do the literature review or when you go through the any commercial review, there are many things for the uh, finance or e-commerce. But for the healthcare, the actual architecture or the machine, uh, the blueprint for the operational system is very, very small. The body of knowledge is very, very small. So you could go to the literature review and you could find ton of the uh, machine learning pipeline, but it is just like an experimental pipeline or the research pipeline, which is not suitable for the production system for the like a nine hospital health system. I guess that was one of the things. And another is, I guess, you need to get a good uh, leadership support. So currently, for, <laughs> for all of our use case, uh, the usability is above 95%. Because even our president look at our predictions, and if somebody is not using it, so he give the feedback. So that is one of the advantage we have. So initially, when you build the model, the first time, maybe the baseline model, it may not be good. But if you get a good leadership support, like we do the very quick iterations. And so that is also another good lesson. Yeah, the, the only thing that I want to uh, actually add to this is everything should stop, uh, start from the bottom. Yeah? So uh, the users should raise, uh, should actually, the uh, optimization opportunity should come from the uh, clinicians at the bedside. Uh, if it comes from the leadership, uh, specifically C level, then uh, that's uh, actually a big problem to actually. Uh, create something useful that uh, physicians can use uh, at the bedside. Yeah. Any other questions here? Hey, so you, how do you go about like searching the data, right? You have data that's, you've aggregated it and you've accumulated it. So if as a new data scientist who wants to come in and use your platform, mm -hmm. so how would you, how would they go and search that data? <laughs> <laughs> so, so for most of our, so currently we have created a custom data science toolkit, so which is in the Scala version and the Python version also. And 
for most of our tool kits, so we have the good API and good docs. So, so when Mukunti started, he started to write a test cases so that he have the complete understanding of the whole data science toolkit. And he also started to write a test cases for the ETL engine so that he have a good understanding of the all the ETLs uh, that has been created. But uh, at this point, I guess m most of the modules which we have has the pretty good documentation. So, uh, so it is fairly easy if somebody start. But when we started, so like Aras mentioned, there is nobody, if we have any questions about the clarity, so for example, how do you create this, um, how do you get all the inpatient um, admission or all the inpatient medications, or if you find an issue in the clarity, there is no centralized system we could ask and somebody could explain, like we could have like a 10 meeting and then they could say that, hey, we don't know. It was very painful, for example, to to understand the data initially. So, are you guys, uh, so with respect to searching that data, right? Hmm? Are you guys trying to tackle it in any way, or how do you tackle that problem? Say, I have huge, I have like 20, 30 tables, right? Mm -hmm. I want to find, I'm predicting something, and I'm finding out all these uh, different data columns. So, do you have you thought about an easy way to go in and search all those? I guess. Yeah, it's so if you're uh, saying the searching in our uh, data producers or searching in our system, because searching in our system is really easy, yeah? Because we have a uh, single view and it's hierarchical. Oh. So you, you want to have a lab, then lab dot what? Sodium, oh. sodium, yeah? Sodium. So it's very easy. In our system, it's very easy. But, but if you're uh, asking about how we can search in the uh, data producers, different platforms, that's the main challenge. We cannot do that. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Are there any other questions? Uh, I'm curious about your time horizon to move to the uh, hybrid cloud. Currently, we are in the development. So probably in the next three or four weeks, we'll be moving everything to the hybrid cloud. Exciting. And Mount Sinai have the Microsoft Azure, so mm. we must use the Microsoft Azure. Microsoft Azure. <laughs> So we in finance, So we wanted we started the conversation of using the cloud when we joined the Mount Sinai. So it took us probably one and a half years or two years to get uh, to get the approval from our IT security. So <laughs> 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 so just like a month or something back, uh, we get an approval like a security assessment and the approval from our IT security saying that we are good to go. Yeah, so adding to this uh, actually Prem's point. Uh, so th the other reason that we want to actually move to cloud because uh, we are adding more uh, items into our platform, yes? Currently we have uh, uh, actually the structured data, we have uh, uh, text data. We want to add genomic, we want to add uh, imaging, uh, we want to add actually waveform data, which is very uh, valuable for us, uh, specifically in the ICU and OR uh, actually applications. Uh, if we go that round, it's really hard to manage everything on premise because we need to have estimation uh, about uh, what would be our growth rate. And that's really tough, that's one thing. The other thing is currently we don't have that uh, data segregation uh, issue. Yeah, so, but we don't have because we are working in one health system uh, and uh, everything is happening in one health system. But if we uh, wanna go and um, actually uh, provide service uh, for different health uh, systems or internationally, then definitely we cannot work on premise because we cannot bring all the data in, in our system. Right. Yeah. Talk about providing those, access to the yes. analytics to our users. So our, our vision is to have the isolated cloud infrastructure for each of our client, from the data lake to the data pipeline to the computation engines. So of course, uh, 
for the Mount Sinai, we have the, everything is big, but for example, if we are just talking about one client, so instead of having like a four TV MongoDB uh, server, we could just have uh, like a 60 gigabyte MongoDB server. So from the clinician side, I guess the actual clinician validation happens during the active pilot phase. So during the, when you create a batch model and the, uh, when the model is in the silent pilot phase, so we have the working group and we present our result in the working group continuously, but actual clinician involvement on actual validation and uh, for example, using the predictions and based on the predictions, going to the bedside and visiting, visiting the patient, actual it happens only during the active pilot phase. Yeah. But only for actually uh, for specific units, the pilot units, not the for uh, for the whole hospital. Only you pick uh, some of the units that they think that is challenging. Uh, for example, uh, our 48 hours discharge planning uh, is, is has really good performance in uh, surgery patients. Yeah, because everything is uh, objective in, in in terms of uh, sur surgery setting, so it's not very subjective. But uh, in uh, cardiac, in uh, oncology, in medicine, is everything is subjective, and there are so many uh, different uh, actually drivers. So they they usually they pick really nasty uh, units and then uh, actually give us a hard time uh, to do the uh, updating and uh, actually that it worked, so far it worked. And uh, when we sh can show that we can update the model and generates good uh, performance in those models, when we go um, for the one hospital, our performance uh, actually boosts a lot. Awesome. Question. Okay, last question. Are you planning to expose the API to outside? So currently we are sharing within the Mount Sinai Health System, the other data scientists are researcher, but in the near term we are not planning to open source it or share to the uh, external hospital, unless they are our collaborator. All right, that was great. Let's give it up for Prem and Arish. Thank you guys so much.